This is The Philanthropy Show, connecting and inspiring philanthropy. Welcome to The Philanthropy Show. I am your host, Luann Saraga Walters. This is part three of a Spotlight On series we're doing on white privilege. And I have been so fortunate to have three amazing guests from an organization known as Community Tampa Bay that's here in Tampa Bay. But um, this is an organization that goes back, wow, a couple of decades at least, and really focusing on discrimination, inclusion, respect, dignity. And I had the fortune of working there. And I want to quickly introduce my guests. If you did not see part one and part two yet, please go back and watch that. We're going to be talking about some um, tangible steps in this in this particular episode. And you'll want to listen in on parts one and two about what is white privilege and really how do we identify it. So Jen Yeagley is the executive director of Community Tampa Bay. We have Sam Abade, the Anytown coordinator, and Sarah Ogdi, the program director, all here. And I said in the last episode that they are all now my teachers. It's always wonderful to, to go through life and meet new teachers who can really help you point inside and look at things. And mm, just namaste to all three of you guys. You're just amazing people. So let's start with this then. And I'm just going to kind of open it up and and let me know who wants to start off by talking but with this being such a large issue how do we even begin to make a difference who wants to start i'll go first um i mean i think sarah mentioned this in the last episode and i think it keeps getting mentioned just because it's so important it's just really important to listen, especially when you are interacting with communities of color, be they queer or otherwise. I think it's just so important. Personally, for me, um, one of the most difficult things is getting humans who belong to majority groups to listen to what you're saying, right? And to listen without putting themselves in the picture, without putting their own experiences in the picture, without mm -hmm. having to retell a story of, actually, you know what? I completely understand what you're saying because when I visited this space abroad, there's not a possibility for you to understand what I'm saying unless you are necessarily living in my skin. Mm -hmm. You know, So uh, acknowledging that, right? Acknowledging that this human or and this group of humans have a completely different experience from me and until and unless I listen uh, with diligence to no way, that I will actually hear what their story is, right? First steps. Personally, in, interpersonally, when having an interaction with someone, I think one of the first steps, that's one of the first steps. A second immediate follow-up is believing people, right? When somebody yeah. tells you, trust their truth, believe that they are speaking their truth because it, it, is, it is their lived experience, right? Um, when having said conversations, following up with, either th thoughts or even speaking it speaking it out to them directly saying things like really i find that so hard to believe is not the most effective way to carry on a conversation right um especially when that person is trying to bridge with you especially when that person is sharing their experience with you um it should be a given that what they are, what they are sharing with you is in fact their truth and therefore indisputable mm. right and coming to that space directly from there right one of the most important things uh, in the wake of everything that has happened over the last few weeks that um, I think is really important for us to understand on multiple levels, right, is that allyship is a process. Allyship is work. It is everyday work. It is not overnight turnaround. That will never happen. It has never happened in all of these years that we have experienced majorities and, and minorities. It has never happened in all of these centuries that we have experienced oppression. Allyship is consistent and constant work. It must be done on a regular basis. Right? Let me just jump in real quick, Sam, because when you say allyship, yeah. uh, uh, define that because some people might hear it as agreeing that everything is the way you say versus what is allyship so okay clarify that proclaiming to be is allyship it's not sound allyship right so standing up and saying i'm an ally is one part it's the beginning it is the very very beginning it is the first baby step right uh but that is not allyship as a whole the reason i say 
allyship is because, like I said, it's a process, right? It is work that must be done, okay? So allyship is the acceptance that there are uh, inequalities in this world. It is the acceptance that there are groups of humans who are experiencing um, oppressions that you may or may not um, experience in your life. It is accepting that you have privilege over other groups of humans, right? And then following that, it is action steps that you take to proactively uh, disempower that or to interrupt those oppressions or those oppressive behaviors when you see them happening. Yeah. Okay. Now that can happen in multiple ways. And being an ally is difficult. It is by no means easy. It is by no means the uh, it is by no means an out. It is by no means an easy way to be a part of the movement. It is a difficult way to be a part of this movement. It means you are making a promise to those groups of humans saying, hey, you know what? If you are in danger, verbal, emotional, or physical, I, I well, you can rely on me to put myself in front of, uh, between you and that danger to help you out. It is also acknowledging the fact that I can engage in allyship, but I also know my strengths and weaknesses. So while I can confidently tell you that I am not in a space and I do not have the physical ability or the bodily ability to put myself uh, between you and physical danger, right? I might be, I have, I've, I've taken absolutely no self-defense classes. I don't even know how to defend myself. I don't know how I will defend you. I have no, I, I, I am not capable of doing that but I will be there if you need somebody to talk to. I will be there if uh, you need somebody to distract you from this person who is being, this person or these people who are being unkind to you. I will be there to talk you through it. I will be there to talk to you during it. Recognizing your strengths, right? Recognizing your strengths and recognizing where you can be an ally in a way that is useful to the person who requires your allyship, right? And that's exactly what I mean when I say a good ally is somebody who can take themselves out of the picture, right? So this is not about you or your bravado, right? And a good ally is not somebody who's thinking about how they can do the bravest thing in that moment or how they can get that gold star for being an ally, right? A good ally is someone who thinks, okay, in this moment, what is the best behavior that I can show or what is the best way in which I can interrupt this, un this unkind or this oppressive behavior that is being exhibited toward this one human or this group of humans in a way that will make them feel safe, in a way that will make them feel supported, in a way that will make them feel protected and okay. What can I do in that moment, right? Let me, for example, if I... Um, Let's say I saw a hijabi Muslim woman, right? And somebody was yelling at her racial slurs, Islamophobic slurs, so on and so forth. Let's say in that space, I was with Jen and Sarah, right? We are in a public space. This is happening with that human being. Despite the fact that I am Muslim, I have to take into account that I am not seemingly Muslim to her. The first thing when she sees me is not that I appear Muslim, very masculine human being, right? I am not completely sure in that moment whether that person sees me as an ally or not, or whether I will only seem more of an aggressor to her, or whether I will add to her stress in that situation. What I will do in that moment is I will ask either Jen or Sarah, who are both feminine presenting, if they could go and talk to this human being, right? Because in my assessing of that moment, perhaps it has come to my uh, attention that she would be more comfortable with a more feminine human being than with a more masculine human being, right? But I would like to believe that it, I will take out of the situation. I'm here right now. I'm also Muslim, and this is what I'm going to do because that is also a person who is Muslim, and I must mitigate the situation in the way that I best see fit, yeah. right? It's yeah. about taking that person into consideration and seeing what's best for them. So you brought up a couple of really great points, and... Uh, and I love that phrase, trust their truth. When you're listening to someone share their story, trust their truth. And it's not, and, and that's kind of what we're seeing. And, and thank you guys again for coming on the show because what I'm seeing happening is that people want to take action, but they're doing it just the opposite of what you just said, Sam. They're, they're wanting to put that 
force into it or and it's not necessarily about what's best for the person who is the recipient of the discrimination or is involved in that situation so that's a great thing to stop and ask um, and I want you to say that one more time and just that phrase stop and think what is the best how did you say that what is the best action that I can take in this moment you said it really eloquently I will try and rephrase <laughs> what is the best action that I can take in this moment that is come that on. will best benefit the person that is experiencing the discrimination awesome well wow. yeah that's that's amazing so, that's very wise too I mean and it's and it's uh, it's healing because it's also taking away the edge of whoever the oppressor is without raising force against and and I and I want to stress that because I'm seeing that not just not physically but a lot of verbal aggression on Facebook with response to certain things and I don't personally feel that's beneficial that doesn't move us forward it's just sharing more animosity as opposed to what Sam is saying about about listening wow you know, that brings me to uh, an, an interesting question, and that is that sometimes we don't always think about how our, uh, our action is helpful or not helpful um, to a person of color. Sarah, you and I had talked briefly about that as we were preparing for this show, and can you um, add on to that a little bit about what is helpful and not helpful uh, to communities with color? Uh, so I'm I'm definitely gonna uh, defer to Sam as she would like to. Well, to okay, start Sam, that it's, you're on. <laughs> uh, and if she would like to defer back, that's fine. But I think as someone who is not a, um, that is not necessarily my space to speak to. But I can certainly speak to my own experience uh, in that in a moment. Your own experience, Great. yeah. So let's go with that. Uh, so I think some things that uh, are helpful in communities of color, certainly, uh, in based on our experience and our programming, assuming that the communities you're working with have the expertise that they need. Uh, so they are the experts on their experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. They might not have the acts or the resources or the opportunities or the wealth or the power uh, to do the things that they know they need to do. But I think deferring to the expertise in the communities and, and allowing those folks uh, to tell you what are the things that are going to be best to build those communities up depending on what the situation is. Um, I think by far uh, there are a lot of times uh, when in guided attempts to be white allies we assume that we know best um, or we assume that because of where we are on our own journey um, that that means that we can stop listening uh, yeah. and I think that that is uh, an incredibly damaging perspective to have and might even be potentially in some situations more damaging um, than some of the overt racism that we're experiencing because mm -hmm. at a bare minimum that is at least out in the open versus sometimes uh, we can do more uh, damage in terms of microaggressions to the, the people who we have built relationships with in our life um, you know when we are not careful about our words and actions uh, I think as a white person it is important for me to own emotions um, and to manage those emotions when I'm interacting with communities of color. So I think we've talked a lot about defensiveness and how we, um, you know, handle being defensive. Uh, but I think also, am I noting when I am feeling anxious or scared or self-conscious when we are talking about race um, and doing that work first and foremost with myself before inviting people of color to do that work for me um, and to to be a partner in that work, um, but not to expect other people to carry that for me. Um, when we think also about the difference between intent and impact, I think a lot of times, whether on an individual basis or when we're working with the whole community, you know, we focus mostly on the intent of what we're trying to do. Well, I didn't intend for that to be racist. I didn't mean to offend you. Um, I didn't mean to not invite any people of color to that meeting. I didn't mean to um, host a community event and not ask any of the people in the community to attend. Uh, and that is all intent focused. Um, and none of those, 
those things that I just mentioned are impact focused. So, you know, the analogy that we often use in our programming is if you step on someone's toe, whether or not you meant to, there's still an impact and their toe still hurts. Uh, so if I just say, well, I didn't mean it, so your toe doesn't hurt anymore, uh, you know, that's not how we move forward. Oftentimes we're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, period. Um, so I think when we are, whether again on and we're working with communities, I think if we are able to apologize, fine. And if we're able to look at what is the impact of our actions, either interpersonally or what is the impact of our actions, you know, on a broader scale uh, and acknowledge those impacts versus our intent, I think those are some of the beginning stages of things that, um, or from my experience, I should say, um, can be incredibly damaging when we ignore those aspects when we're working with communities of color. That's, that's, a lot of good awesomeness too and and sam i want to ask you a question as you as you begin to answer this other part of it and go back a little bit to what you had said a minute ago about when someone is sharing their experience with you and you trust their truth don't necessarily come in with an oh i understand what you mean because i had this experience kind of example and i think that that might be a little confusing because our training is to show that we're relating to somebody is to offer a similar example of our own so how can we address that how do we show that we are listening and understanding and trying to form that bond that's that kind of goes back to that cultural desire to you know to mesh together how can we do that without then discounting by using our own example um, uh, your experience or whoever is sharing that experience? Well, I mean, I think there's multiple ways in which we can do that. If you are so um, motivated, you know, to share a story, to show that you have related, you, you can relate to that person. I think it would, I think it would help in many ways to say something even as uh, tame as, wow, I couldn't possibly imagine what that went through. I mean, the only time I have likely experienced anything remotely close to that is right. so and so, so and so, you know, and relating that story, right? Got because it. if I'm talking to you about a story that I had about growing up gay in India and you say I completely understand, it's a little hard for that, that it doesn't actually match. Right. Because logically there is no connection. And it, and it feels like if somebody is trying to do that, that you your sharing has kind of just been discounted um, right. in Either a manner. Or, yeah, and then that comment makes it makes their listening in, disingenuous at that point. Got it. Got it. Okay. What are you some know, other? I think I think we do we we do suffer a little bit from this. Uh, concept of not being able to just listening is an active listening is an active uh, participating skill in any conversation, right? We seem to think that dialogue or conversation requires two participants speaking, but really what it needs is one participant speaking and the other participant listening, right? And I think we have failed to mitigate that portion of it. So we're constantly, everyone's constantly talking and we seem to end up, end up talking over each other, which is why no one's actually hearing anything that the other person is saying. And so I think we need to reevaluate the importance of that skill, especially in this moment that we are in. Oh man, you just totally gave me another aha. I'm telling you, thank you for being my new teacher. When you <laughs> said, I'm serious, when you just said that, and I think part of the reason that so many people are so inclined, myself included, I have done this myself, to, to, to want to share, to want to talk over, to want to say, yeah, but, especially Facebook allows that so much, is because Everyone has a desire to be heard. And if we could practice the skill of listening more avidly and, al and allow people the opportunity to know they've truly been heard, there would be less need to want to be heard because we would feel that. We would feel that human bond that, that takes place by doing it. Wow, Sam, that was, that was poignant. That's what Oprah calls a tweetable moment. <laughs> That was awesome. Wow. All right. So I interrupted you on that, but in, in continue on, we're looking at the what is helpful and not helpful to or with communities of color and the perspective on that. Do you have anything more in, in discussion of that? I do have one last thing. Um, I feel like um, a lot of communities of color, right? So a lot of communities, especially, um, we get a lot of questions. We get a lot of questions that sometimes I feel, you know, you could have looked that up. 
right? Or you could have done your research on that. You could have read up a little bit before you came to the table with such a basic question, right? With something that I don't really feel like answering because it is, it is fundamental. And I know that you came to the table without doing any work, right? Mm. Like a farm. I want to form collaborative bonds of allyship with those humans that I know are willing to work with me just as hard as I am on my movement toward moving forward. I need to know that I'm working with people who have a desire to and want to do the work, right? Now, proclaiming that you have a desire to do the work is one thing. Actually, doing the work is a whole other ballgame altogether, right? And I think we are a little remiss when we think that it's okay to want a first-person response or a first or a first-person human resource will give us all the answers when we have such incredible access to knowledge, right? By way of the internet, yeah. by way of so many different libraries that we have uh. online and otherwise, we have so much access. There are so many ways, shapes and forms in which we can be doing the work, just reading up and informing our and how we are and how we live or who is and how they are and how they live and the, the struggles that they face and what their emotions are and what their beliefs are and you know the the culture of, of those identities just doing the work of having read up on that even if you come to me with a table of quotes and say so as so and so said as this one said as that one says so and so other said i will at least know okay you gave me 10 different quotes from 10 different authors of color I know you've done your work, you know, to some extent, you're bringing something to the table instead of saying, here I am, I know nothing, I have done absolutely nothing, now you educate me, mm -hmm. right? Well, because you know what, that, really you, you well. just, oh man, you just hit it though. Isn't that white privilege though, in a way, is saying, okay, I grew 100%. up in this culture, so this is my culture, so then any other culture, then it's your responsibility to educate me on, because. Without question, 100%. Wow, wow. Without question, until you can give me a full historical analysis of, you know, what is your, what you consider your culture, aka, I don't know, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, right? Until you can give me a full background on that. We got a little, we got a little feedback going on here for a second. Um, I think Jen was going to pop in there too. So let me, oh, let sorry. Me. Oh my gosh, I unmuted. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Were you going to say something, Jen? Yeah, yeah, space. Yeah, I, <laughs> so one of the things I did when Sam was talking, because I feel like, you know, in moving forward, one of the things that is encouraging, I think, is this sort of explosion of people, many of them white, realizing maybe for the first time um, that we are, in fact, not post-racial because we did elect a black president, you know, in Obama, realizing that, as Sarah said earlier, racism continues to be a real thing and is experienced by people around us. And so, you know, people are, are maybe awakening to this um, and saying, oh gosh, I do want to talk about white privilege and I do want to own it and I do want to take some steps. Um, and so I think that what we must caution ourselves against is, you know, exactly what Sam is saying is we have such a great opportunity now to engage in this discussion um, and to move forward as allies in a way that is productive and does not cause further harm to communities of color. And it's, you know, exactly in the ways that Sam is saying, where it's now that I have, you know, I am quote unquote awakened, you know, to my white privilege and I want to make a difference and I'm fired up about it and that's amazing. Um, I am not entitled now, you know, to go corner Sam um, and say, okay, so tell me all the things now that I need to know about racism so that I can be an ally. Um, and then worse yet, you know, if, if perhaps we do engage in that and we are confronted with someone who says, you know, I appreciate that you want to learn, but it's actually not my job to do that. It'd be great if you could educate yourself. And then I become defensive in that moment and decide, you know, I have an emotional reaction and then I turn off and then, right, there's this whole potential spiral that could happen. And so what I would encourage, you know, us as white people to do in this moment, um, whether we are ourselves just now awakening, you know, to white privilege and, and wanting to act or whether we are in a, our next chapter of allyship or wherever we are in our journey, is to really um, reflect and as you know as we've said many times in this conversation to take some time to reflect to take some time to listen um, mm -hmm. and to educate ourselves to lay that groundwork to begin to notice the world around us to begin to notice um, when a stereotype that perhaps we hold pops up for us and all that 
bias and, and, and to acknowledge it and to turn toward it and, and then to, you know, to interrupt it in ourselves rather than becoming self-righteous and saying, well, now I have experienced this and I, I am awake to this now. And so now I will begin to um, point my at you or to, you know, interrupt these things in very aggressive, non-productive ways, because I, I do feel like that, you know, whether we're looking at sort of the proxy of that on social media, where we're getting into all kinds of arguments and things that aren't going to get us anywhere, or the way that plays out in the real world, which is lots of arguing and not a lot of moving forward, um, further damages, you know, sort of an already oppressive society um, for our colleagues and friends and family members of color. Um, if in fact, as white people, you know, now we have decided now is the time to act and to mobilize and to engage, um, I would, I would invite all of us, you know, to do that in ways that are mindful and productive and bridging and helpful. Um, and to not simply rush forward, now this is the new thing that we want to engage in, and we have decided that we are entitled now to engage in this work um, and to kind of, you know, stomp all over things, which um, I think when we get excited about things, you know, all of us as humans can be a tendency. And so um, I think as we think about actions to take, some of that, you know, reflection and listening is, is, is perhaps a great first step. That's awesome. Well, and that's a, that's a great way to kind of encapsulate this series and, and motivate us to go forward um, with, with respect and dignity in the forefront of our minds, uh, that being the fire of our intention in taking action. So again, wow, if you missed parts one and two, I would highly recommend that you go back. This has um, just been such a an honor for me to be able to lead this discussion, but especially because of the the three guests that are on this, um, who are working in this diligently every day for all of the people within our community and with the vision of seeing this happen throughout you know the world. And and I really respect everything that you guys are doing. Thank you for what you're doing. I think that this time, this this special pre and post election time of what we've just seen has. And what we're living in really shows us the essential nature of your work and what you do and what other organizations like yours are doing throughout at least our country and I know throughout the world. So Jen Yegley, Executive Director of Community Tampa Bay, Sarah Ogdi, Program Director, and Sam Obeyed, Anytown Coordinator. Go Anytown. We love Anytown. Thank you, all three of you, for being on the show. Thank you for coming on and sharing your insight Thank you for being my teacher and for all of us um, and coming together for this. So, you know, love to, to hear your comments uh, and, and suggestions and whatnot for future shows. You can email me at tps at myvideovoice.com or luann at myvideovoice.com. And really, I, I want this platform to be something that's beneficial to everybody. So if you can think of some more ways, if you say, hey, I want to hear more about white privilege, can we talk a little bit further? I'm game, as long as they are as well. Like we could, <laughs> I'm sure we could do a lot more in the discussion around it. So thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank my three guests who are on. And here's to being the change that we want to see in the world. Take care, everyone.